What do you think of when you hear the term 15 minute city? Proximity, ease of access to everyday amenities, good transit, walkability, and population density probably come to mind. But what I hear missing from a lot of discussion on 15 minute cities is for whom they should be developed. We hear a lot about proximity to services or commerce or amenities. We hear a lot about bikes and walkability. We hear a lot about public plazas and dense urban housing, but the discussion still seems to lean abstract with the concept used more as a tool for marketing than one for livability, at least here in the US. There can be a very capitalist tint to the discussion here, and historically, that hasn't meant anything good for low or middle income people, communities of color, immigrants, or others whose voices have been overlooked for generations. Just as we hear in our housing discussion, we seem to be having a hard time moving past widgets, numbers of units, numbers of buildings, numbers of people. And when housing affordability is deliberately discussed, it is separate from the overall context. We have discussions, we make policy, we build housing and affordable housing. Affordable being focused on people earning usually less than 80% or 60% of area median income. And housing is focused on whoever can afford it. From those discussions come policy and physical capital decisions that reflect this continued separation. In our newer forms of mixed income housing, we still see it. Seattle's affordability mandate maxes out near 10%. And developers can opt out entirely by paying into a pot that funds low-income housing off-site, somewhere else, separated. In my eyes, this is the definition of not in my backyard. But there is a glimmer of hope on the horizon. Seattle did just pass a ballot initiative to form a social housing development authority that will one day oversee truly income diverse communities with neighbors sharing walls in high quality union built green developments. In these developments, affordability mandates will be flipped, creating an intentional universal mix of affordability. But this gets to the crux of the issue. Cities like housing cannot be for everyone without intentionality. Just as supply and demand play a role, but aren't the only determining factors in affordability, proximity alone won't create social cohesion and it won't build cities for everyone. In the same vein, fostering and promoting an equitable array of services, amenities, and commerce takes work. At minimum, it takes policy changes to promote a working mix. A neighborhood isn't made equitable by the simple inclusion of a second-hand store or a food bank, a walk-in clinic, affordable housing development, or a place offering meal services. Resources should be equally available to all people. Low- and middle-income people want and deserve nice things, too. They deserve access to high quality, fresh food, health care, child care, shops and restaurants, just like anyone else. And this intentionality that I'm talking about can and should manifest in new ways of doing things, new policies, and yes, even new regulations that ensure we don't just continue redlining by another name. I've cited the example of the Quartier République in Nantes in a previous video and how they're building the neighborhood with an intentional mix of housing types, uses, services, and rent-controlled commercial spaces in order to allow small and micro businesses to offer a diverse collection of needs for an income-diverse population. And that's just one example. Building a 15-minute city rests on so much more than proximity. We need to ensure that our construction workers, teachers, nurses, grocery workers, delivery drivers, and baristas can live and work and thrive in the same place. That's not going to happen on its own. America's 15-minute city discussion skims over social equity, but it needs to center it. It can't be built on the fetishization of cities that we love but rather through developing true, equitable 15-minute neighborhoods by diving deep on why we love places like Barcelona or Paris or Amsterdam. What are Edo Colau and Anidalgo doing that we're not? 
How does Barcelona and Commune's focus on community care translate to real-world community building? How is Paris en Commune's focus on new social housing acquisition, construction, and integration reflected in neighborhood diversity? How can we lift inspiration from some of these rather leftist ideas that are starting to make these cities better places for everyone? And in some cases, how do we just copy those ideas outright? Which we can do. Just a couple of examples. When I was co-chair of the Seattle Renters Commission, we pushed for two policies that didn't exist in the U.S. before we tried. One was a ban on winter evictions, and the other... 180 days notice for rent increases. We won both. And those policies came from France and Quebec, respectively. We're at a point where collectively we can shift the tide of urban policy from neoliberalism to something that uplifts everyone from the ground up instead of waiting for benefits to possibly trickle down. I believe we can do this, but we need to do this together. I have hope, and I hope you do too. Thank you.